Welcome to From His Heart, where Pastor Jeff Shreve is in an inspiring new series today entitled Land of the Giants, How to Deal with Your Biggest Problems. In today's lesson, he'll explore what may be the biggest problem that you have. It's called the giant of anger. If you have your Bible, please turn to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, we want to talk about the giant of anger. We're in a series called Land of the Giants, and today we're looking at the giant of anger. I heard about a trucker. He pulled into a roadside diner, and he ordered cheeseburger, a malt, and an apple pie. He was sitting there at the table. The waitress comes with his cheeseburger, his malt, his apple pie, and he was getting ready to eat it, and then all of a sudden, these three biker guys came into the roadside diner. They were tough-looking guys, and they were looking for trouble. They spotted the trucker, and they came to where he was seated, and they just glared at him for a minute, and then one of the truckers grabbed his cheeseburger and took a huge bite and put it down. Another one of the bikers grabbed his chocolate milkshake and drank half of it, put it down. The third biker took his apple pie and just gobbled it up and just left the crust, and they just glared at him. Trucker didn't do anything. He just got up, paid his bill, and left. Well, the bikers were kind of laughing uh, amongst themselves, and finally one of them said to the waitress, they said, well, that trucker, he's not much of a man, is he? She said, well, he's not much of a driver either. He just ran over three choppers on his way out of here. <laughs> the giant of anger. You know, I think if we're honest, all of us would say, hey, I've encountered the giant of anger. And the giant of anger is a tough, tough Giants. We talked about Goliath last week, and maybe your Goliath, your, your main Goliath that you fight, maybe it is anger. You know, all of us deal with anger, but some, it's really, anger is really eating your lunch. I want you to take a little anger test with me to see if you might be an angry person. Do you have a quick temper? Do you, do you seem to go off very quickly? Do minor irritations cause you to lose it? I mean, things like traffic, things like the, the computer not working right, the printer getting jammed, going out to eat and spilling food on your shirt. Does that cause you to really blow a gasket? Do you tend to blame others for your outbursts? Well, it's my wife's fault, it's my husband's fault, it's my mom's fault, it's my uh, son's fault, it's my daughter's fault, it's my boss's fault. It's always someone else's fault. Do you find yourself in conflict with a lot of different people? You know, if you're having trouble in this area of life, trouble getting along with people at home, trouble getting along with people at work, trouble getting along with neighbors, trouble getting along with this person, that person, and the other person, Newsflash, it's not all these other people, it is you. You are the common denominator. Do you have difficulty submitting to authority? Did you, do you just hate it when someone is over you and that, that just causes the hair on the back of your neck to bristle? Do you find it very difficult to forgive those who have hurt you? See, it could be that you are really dealing with the giant of anger, and maybe you haven't wanted to face that fact. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 9 says this, 
Be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. So here's our question. Do you understand the giant of anger, and do you understand and know how to defeat the giant of anger? Now, to help us understand, we're going to look at the first human being who was ever said to have been angry. His name was Cain. The Bible says this about him in Genesis chapter 4. Now the man, Adam, had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. And again she gave birth to his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Cain was a farmer. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. And Abel on his part also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. He had a scowl on his face. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. And Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. The giant of anger. Notice with me three insights about this giant that we all face, the giant of anger. Insight number one, the giant of anger is not righteous indignation. You know, we read in the Bible about God getting angry. You know, God, he, he gets angry over sin. He gets angry at injustice. He gets angry at unbelief. When God called Moses at the burning bush, you know, Moses didn't want to go. He kept saying he, he had all these excuses. And the scripture says that the anger of the Lord burned against Moses because he kept uh, trying to dodge God's plan for his life. Now, God, when he gets mad, it's called righteous indignation because God is righteous. He is holy, holy, holy. The Bible says in Psalm 7, verse 11, God is a fair judge, a righteous judge, a God who is angered by injustice every day. So God gets angry. Anger just by itself is not necessarily, well, that's always wrong because you should never get angry. Jesus got angry. Jesus cleansed the temple. He made a whip and he uh, turned over the tables of the money changers, and he drove them out with a whip. He was angry, and he, he had passion and zeal for his house. And he said, it is written, my father's house should be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. He was angry. But the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, be angry, and yet do not sin. And do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil an opportunity. The Lord always has righteous indignation. He's angry, but he doesn't ever sin because he's angry at sin, at injustice, at unbelief. We can get angry reading things in the paper or knowing that uh, this terrible thing happened, that terrible thing happened. You read about sex trafficking, and it just grieves your heart and can make you angry that these people are doing these terrible things. That's not a sin. Be angry, and yet do not sin and don't let the sun go down on your anger, and don't give the devil a place. Because when you allow anger, unrighteous anger, like Cain had, when you allow that to have a place in your heart and you respond in anger, it's like throwing a welcome mat out for the devil, and he will wreak havoc in your life. It's a horrible thing. That is the anger that we're talking about, the giant of anger, not unrighteous uh, indignation, but unrighteous sin that leads to disaster. Second insight, where does the giant of anger come from? It comes from a desire 
for control. Really, when you boil it down, what is anger all about? It's a desire for control. I want you to do what I want you to do. My good friend and seminary preaching professor, Wayne McDill, has a great definition of anger. He says this, anger is the feeling of hostility and aggression in reaction to some circumstance or event that poses a threat to one's control. It can range from irritation to rage. It deals with the issue of authority. As we read the story of Cain, and Cain is the emphasis of Genesis chapter 4. His name is mentioned 16 times, twice as many times as Abel's name is mentioned. Second to the last book of the Bible in the book of Jude is still talking about Cain. First John chapter 3 talks about Cain being of the evil one, and he killed his brother, slew his brother. And Cain's situation, he is mad at God because God is not doing what Cain wants him to do. God is doing it God's way, and Cain wants God to do it Cain's way. Now, to understand this story, we need to remember as we read the Bible, uh, many people get hung up. They go, Genesis 3 is the key chapter in the Old Testament. It's the fall of man when Adam and Eve eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, and their eyes are opened, and they fall from their innocence with the Lord and their righteousness with the Lord, and they fall from that, and their eyes are opened, and they see things they wish they had never seen, and they learn things they wish they had never learned, and they're banished from the Garden of Eden. Now, when they sinned, they knew that they were naked. And so what did they do? They sowed fig leaves to cover their nakedness. And when God confronts them, and says, Adam, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. The Lord said, who told you you were naked? Did you eat of the fruit of the tree that I commanded you not to eat? And the Lord has a confrontation with Adam and with Eve and he curses the serpent. And then we read that God clothed Adam and Eve with coats of skin, with animal skin. And the way he did that wasn't through uh, a land's end order. It was through sacrifice. He killed uh, an innocent animal, and that animal died. And from that animal, he took the animal skins, and he clothed Adam and Eve. And so Adam and Eve learned on the day they sinned that the wages of sin really is death, Romans 3.23. And without the shedding of blood, Hebrews chapter 9, there is no forgiveness of sin. See, the book of Leviticus 17.11 says this, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. And God said, I've given you the blood sacrifice to atone, to cover your sins and to cover your souls. And so they were taught all that in a very uh, preliminary, rudimentary way, but they were taught that the day that they sinned. And no doubt they taught their children that. Now, the Lord had given them a command, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And they did. I don't know how many kids Eve had, but she had a ton. Maybe a hundred. I mean, we think a big family. How many do you have? Well, I have five kids. She had a hundred. Uh, you know, we don't know. But we know that from two people, they populated everything. And so when this story takes place in Genesis chapter 4, there were probably, uh, there have been about 120, 125 years have passed. How do we know this? Because it says at the end of chapter 4 that Adam and Eve had a son to take the place of Abel who was killed. And when Adam and Eve had that son, Adam was 130 years old. Sometimes we read this passage and we think, well, Genesis 3 happened and then Genesis 4. I mean, these guys are probably uh, maybe 20 years old. They're not very old. They're probably 120 years old. There, there has been a gap of time. There has to be a gap of time because Cain is going to find a wife. And so there have to be lots of kids born to Adam and Eve for him to do that. But the Lord had communicated to Cain and to Abel, when you come before me, you come with a blood 
sacrifice. And we know that's true because the scripture says in Hebrews chapter 11 that Abel, Abel by faith offered a more acceptable sacrifice than did his brother. How did he do it? He did it by faith. Where does faith come? Where did the faith come from? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Nobody's ever had faith without, outside of the word of God. So God had communicated to those boys, probably from mom and dad, that when you come before the Lord, you come with a blood sacrifice. That's the way Abel came, humbly, obediently, came before the Lord with a blood sacrifice. How did Cain come? Cain's a farmer, and he says, well, look at what all I've done. He came with the works of his hands. He came with the sweat of his brow, and he came and he brought a, a big basket of fruit fruits and vegetables to the Lord. Lord, look what I have for you. God had no regard for Cain and his offering. God wouldn't look upon Cain's offering. That's not the way I told you to come. And so Cain gets mad, hopping mad, burning mad, because God accepted Abel's offering and Abel's sacrifice, and he didn't accept Cain and Cain's sacrifice. Hey, when you come to God, you have to come God's way. Now, here's the heart of anger. The heart of anger is the heart of sin and the core of sin, and it's this, wanting to be in charge and have it your way. That was the sin of Adam and Eve. If you eat of this fruit, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil, and you won't need God. You won't have to depend upon God. You can be your own cheap tin God. And she said, that's what I want, because I want to be in charge. I want to be captain of my own ship. I don't want to have to depend upon God. And sin is rooted in pride in the big eye, and anger is tied into that, wanting to be in charge and have it your way. Now, God is in charge, and we have to trust his way. We have to go his way, not just in, in the offering, but in life. Because, see, we get mad when things don't go the way we want them to go. We have this idea that, you know, when I get in the car and drive, everybody should do what I want them to do. You know, you ever get in the car and drive and, and you, you run across some driver that's going slow? You think, that idiot, He's, why is he going so slow? George Carlin, the comedian, used to say, have you ever noticed that when you're driving in the car, everyone who drives slower than you is an idiot, and everyone who drives faster than you is crazy? I mean, that's what we do. That idiot's driving so Look at that crazy guy going so fast. Uh, but we, we feel like we ought to be able to control the road and, and control how everyone drives and control how everything works and, and control our kids and how they respond to everything. And hey, we're not in control of much. God's in control of everything, and you choose God's way, you don't choose your own way. And even when things happen outside of your control, but obviously not, not outside of God's control, something happens that you don't like, driving home on a Friday night, a drunk driver crosses the median, hits you, and now you're in the hospital with a punctured lung and broken bones, and you're saying, what gives? Why did this happen? You can get so angry. I had a friend of mine whose wife was hit by a driver who crossed the median. He was a truck driver, and he had been up for so many hours, and he, he uh, just, just fell asleep at the wheel, ran into his wife, uh, hurt her so badly. He died in the accident. The first person on the scene checked the truck driver, checked my friend Gary's wife, saw that the truck driver was dead, saw that she was hurt badly. He took her purse and left. Well, Gary's wife was never the same. He told me once in a moment of honesty as he dealt with the giant of anger, he said, that guy, that truck driver, he took everything from me in my relationship with my wife. She's not the same person because of what happened. He said, Jeff, sometimes I feel like going to the cemetery and digging up his body and beating him. 
hey, I understood what he was dealing with, all the rage that was there. Things are outside of our control. How do we handle those things? How do we not get angry at God when he doesn't do what we want him to do? We need to remember God is in charge. Nothing comes into your life or into my life that doesn't first filter through God's fingers of love. And God has a plan and a purpose for anything and everything that he allows to come to us. Satan couldn't get at Job till God let down the hedge. And all that came into Job's life first filtered through God's fingers of love. God didn't cause that, but he allowed it to happen. And you know what Job said? Greatest verse in the book of Job, Job 13, 15, though he slay me, speaking of God, though God slay me, yet will I trust in him. I don't understand this, but I'm going to trust God because he's good and he loves me and he works in ways that I can't understand and I can't see. The Lord asks Cain a question, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? Why is anger written all over your face? Why is there such a scowl on your face? It's because, God, you're not doing as I want you to do. Because, God, you need to do my will. I don't do your will. The giant of anger comes, for a desire, comes from a desire for control. And insight number three, the giant of anger is defeated when you choose God's grace over your control. Look at it again. Verse six. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? God is gentle with Cain. He's kind and merciful with Cain. He says, now when God asks Cain, why are you angry? God's not asking for information. The Lord never asks a question where he's trying to gain information. He knows everything. He knew exactly why Cain was angry. But he says, why are you angry, Cain? Why don't you start to uh, really consider this, Cain? Why are you so angry? Does it make sense for you to be so angry, Cain? Because I set up how you're supposed to come to me, and you're coming to worship me. Well, if you're going to come worship me, you better come my way. You can't come any old way. You can't come your way and expect me to rubber stamp that. God says, that doesn't make sense, does it? Why are you so angry? Why has your countenance fallen? And then he says in verse 7, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, take heed. Sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Now, it's important to remember, God wants to help you with your anger. He wants to help me. He wants to help us as we deal with that giant of anger that pops up in our lives. As we think about anger, in the definition that Wayne McDill gave, anger is the feeling of hostility and aggression in reaction to some circumstance or event that poses a threat to one's control. So there's a circumstance or an event that triggers the anger, whether it's somebody cutting you off in traffic, whether it's your wife not leaving you any pizza, whether it's just something that triggers the outburst of anger. And so there's a progression with anger. Every angry person and every outburst of anger, it always starts with a hurt. There is first a hurt. There's something that happens to you, some event, some circumstance that hurts you some way, somehow. Whether it hurts you physically or it hurts you emotionally, it hurts you professionally, it hurts you in some way. And that hurt will always turn to anger. The flip side of the coin of hurt is anger. Every, every person that is angry and walking around angry, you can be sure that that person has been hurt in his or her life. They hurt by a dad, hurt by a mom, hurt by a boss, hurt by a coach, hurt by someone, hurt by a sibling, hurt by a drunk driver, whatever it might be. But there's a hurt there and they, they, they trace it back. It's like, well, I got hurt. Now, Cain suffered the sting of rejection from God over his offering. There was hurt there, and that hurt turned to anger. 
Now, if you don't process the anger correctly, then the hurt goes to anger, goes to resentment and bitterness. That is the flow. And then when you allow bitterness to get in your heart, it's Katie bar the door, because when you start to resent a person or get bitter at a person, then you start to churn that and mull that over and you start to think of the ways that that person could, you could hurt them back. Uh, you start plotting revenge and things like that. And that leads to disaster. Cain was hurt. And because he didn't process the hurt correctly, he was very angry. And that anger turned to resentment and bitterness. And who was that toward? That was toward God. Now, he took it out on Abel, his brother. He's angry and bitter at God. He's jealous of Abel, his brother. And I believe that any person that you see that's an angry person, that's a resentful, bitter person, their problem deep down, and they know it if they'll step back and really look at it, they're always bitter at God. A God. Why? Because God is in control of all things. That's why. And if God had just done what he should have done, if he had stepped up, if he had protected me, then this wouldn't have happened. So the problem is really with God, although we don't like to say that. So we say, well, it's this person that I'm mad at. No, you're really mad at God, and your bitterness problem is with God. God wants to help you process that. Cain, why are you angry, and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? So let's talk about doing well. See, God wants to help you with your anger. God wants you to do well with your anger so that you can have victory over your anger. So when the Lord says to Cain, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? What does he mean by that? What does doing well look like? What was Cain supposed to do? Well, what Cain was supposed to do is the same thing you and I are supposed to do when we struggle with the giant of anger. Number one, we humble ourselves. Victory comes when you humble yourself. Cain was walking in pride. Cain was wanting my way. He was singing that Frank Sinatra song, I'll do it my way. And God says, no, you're not going to do it your way. I'm the king, and we do it my way. And so victory comes first step. You humble yourself before God. And you say, Lord, this isn't about my way. It's all about your way. You're the king, and I am uh, nothing. As the scripture says, all, all the nations are as nothing in his sight. They are regarded by him as nothing and less than meaningless and less than nothing. I mean, God is the great king of the universe. The audacity for Cain to try and tell God how things ought to be is just mind-blowing. But we do the very same thing when we want our way. Hey, the scripture says, 1 Peter chapter 5, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety, your cares upon him because he cares for you. So that's the first step in victory over the giant of anger. You humble yourself. Secondly, you confess your sin. Cain needed to humble himself before God. He needed to confess, God, I am angry with you and I'm wrong to be angry with you. Because this isn't about Cain. Life isn't about Cain. Life is all about you, Lord. And I confess my sins. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then thirdly, victory comes. Now, this is a hard one for lots of people. Victory comes when you forgive from the heart. You forgive from the heart. You don't just forgive with lip service. You really forgive. Jesus said that in Matthew chapter 18, the great parable on forgiveness. And when he told the, the story about the, the servant who owed his master 10,000 talents, which is an, an amount that is far exceeds anything that anyone could comprehend in that day and age, and that master forgave, he released the servant of that debt, and then that servant went and found somebody else who owed him a pittance compared to what he owed the master, and he grabbed him by the throat and he threw him into jail, and he said, you're not gonna get out of here till you pay the very last cent, and when the master heard what that 
servant had done. He brought him before him. He said, I had mercy on you, even though you owed me such a great debt, and you found a fellow servant who owed you a pittance in comparison, and you threw him into jail. And the Bible says that the master was moved with anger, and he threw that unrighteous servant into prison, and he said, you're going to stay in there till you pay every last cent, which was impossible. And then Jesus said, thus shall my heavenly Father do to you if you don't forgive your brother from your heart. To really forgive. And that's hard for lots of people. You know, uh, I think the most recognizable prayer in the Bible is what's commonly referred to as the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And many people know that. We learned it uh, as kids growing up. But we don't know the verses that follow. The very next verse says this, for if you forgive men for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. How are you going to walk with God if God won't forgive you? You can't. You can't. You better not, never sin again if God says, I'm not going to forgive you. We're in trouble. And the Lord says, hey, forgive us our trespasses. Father, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Well, how do you forgive your debtor? Because that's the way God's going to forgive you. If you hold your debtor uh, by the throat, so to speak, and say, you owe me, you hurt me, I'm going to dig up your dead body, as my friend Gary said, and beat you because I have such hatred and bitterness and animosity in my heart for what happened to me, what happened to my wife, but how that affects me you got to forgive from your heart. You know, I want you to think of anger in terms of a meter. We have a meter that we're going to put, a little thermometer. That's kind of the anger meter. And I want you to see from zero to ten. A person who is at peace with God and with man, his anger meter is at zero. At zero, he, he's just, his heart is right, and he's not angry and bitter at anyone. And when things happen in life, and they, they jostle you, you have minor irritations, you get cut off in traffic, or, or the computer dies right when you're printing something uh, important and you lose all the work. I mean, you, you go play golf. If some of you don't have a problem with anger, take up golf, and uh, you'll, you'll learn about uh, how, how it is to fight the giant of anger. But you do any of those things. So what happens to the meter? It goes up two, three points. Now, 10 at the top, that's where you go ballistic. You go ape at 10. But if you start off at zero and somebody does something to you, maybe it goes up two or three points, but you're still, everything's under control because you're only at a three. Maybe something else happens. Maybe you're at a five or a six. And see, you got to get that processed to get it down so you're back at zero. Here's what happens in people's lives, especially in marriages. The meter goes up because of hurts, and it doesn't go down because the people don't process the hurts. And so something happened. He did this to me and he did that to me. And all of a sudden, the meter is at about a seven and a half or an eight. Listen, if you're walking around with an anger meter at eight and 10 means you go ballistic, it doesn't take much for you to go up two points. Sometimes you're around somebody and something minor will happen and they just freak out. And you're like, what in the world? happened to you? I mean, I, I'm sorry. I just bumped you and you spilled your coffee and you, 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 you're ready to throw me to the lions. Why is that? It's because their meter's hanging at about an eight. Never goes down. You can't live like that. Ada Ferguson, our counselor who's in heaven now, she used to talk about three words, sad, mad, bad. 
Some of you who saw Ada know that she would talk about that a lot, sad, mad, bad. And what she would say is this, sad, something happens to you that hurts you. And that sad always turns to mad because the, the other side of the coin with hurt is anger. So if you don't process your sad correctly, you're going to get mad. And then if you don't process the mad and bring that to the Lord and humble yourself and confess that to the Lord and get things right, then that mad turns to bad. And that's what happened to Cain. Hey, victory comes when you humble yourself, when you confess your sin, when you forgive from the heart, and when you go God's way. That, that's what God is giving Cain the opportunity. He said, Cain, listen, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? All you have to do, Cain, is humble yourself and bring a blood sacrifice to me and offer that blood sacrifice to me, and I will accept you and your offering. you got to change your heart. You know, the, the sacrifice he brought revealed a rotten, prideful, sinful heart. So you got to change your heart. And if you do that, then I'll accept you and your countenance will be lifted up. But if you don't do it, let me tell you something, Cain, that you don't understand. Right on the other side of the door, there is sin, and it is crouching, and it is waiting like a lion, and it will devour you. Sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. So God wants to help you with your anger. God wants you to deal well, to do well with your anger. And God wants you to master your anger so it doesn't master you. As we read the story, Cain didn't do what God told him to do. The Bible says in Jude chapter 1, verse 11, Woe to them, they've gone the way of Cain. The way of Cain is the way of woe. The way of Cain is I'm going to do it my way. And God, if you don't accept me, then you know what I'm going to do? Okay, God, you want a blood sacrifice? I'll give you a blood sacrifice. And he went and talked to his brother, Abel. And he lured Abel out into the field. And the Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 12, that Cain, who was of the evil one, slew his brother Abel. Why? Because Cain's deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Now it says in 1 John 3, I learned this from my friend Josh Harrison. I thought it was such a great point. 1 John 3, it uses the word slew. He slew his brother Abel. That word slew literally means to butcher an animal sacrifice, to slit the throat of an animal sacrifice. And this shows Cain's heart. He says, God, you want a blood sacrifice? I'll give you a blood sacrifice. And he went out and slit the throat of his brother Abel and brought disaster into his life. That's what happens when anger is out of control. And you know, just like anything, we think that, oh, I got this under control. But unless you're going God's way with your anger, unless you're choosing his grace over your control, that anger is gonna one day take you down Sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. I think I told you some months ago about this book I read. I read it while I was recovering from my hip replacement surgery. It's called The Longest Trek, My Tour of the Galaxy by Grace Lee Whitney. She played uh, yeoman Janice Rand in the original Star Trek series, she only got to play in about 11 episodes or so because they wrote her out of the show. She was sexually accosted by one of the executives on the show, and to cover up that uh, sexual assault, they just axed her from the show. Grace Lee Whitney had tremendous problems as a result of that. She was already struggling with alcoholism, and she just uh, went into alcoholism full-blown full bore, and alcoholism turned to drug addiction, and that turned to a sexual addiction, and she was just an awful person, totally out of control, angry and bitter at the things that happened to her. Well, in her story, she comes to know Christ. 
She is delivered and set free from all her addictions, and she begins to work with others to help them through their addictions. And she's doing so well, but then something happened to one of the girls she was working with. Her name was Carrie. And Carrie had taken her boss's car by his request, his red Porsche, taken it out to run some errands. It was a uh, convertible, and it was very sharp and uh, snazzy looking, and she took it out in California, in Los Angeles area. She was carjacked. The young men ran into her car, and when she got out to talk to them about it, they kidnapped her, and they stole the car. They took Carrie to an apartment building and to an apartment there that they had. Ten men raped her repeatedly for four days. When they were done with her, they took her to East L.A., shot her twice in the head, and dumped her out on the street like she was a bag of garbage. She didn't die. Amazingly, she didn't die. She crawled to a, a store and got the clerk to call 911. They rushed her to the hospital. They did surgery. They removed a bullet from her head. The other bullet they couldn't take out, but she survived. Well, when Grace Lee Whitney heard what happened to her friend Carrie, she said, I got so angry. And that was right to get angry, righteous indignation. But she got so angry, and that anger, that hurt, turned to a seething, boiling hatred. And she said, I hated the men that did that to my friend Carrie. She said, I would think in my mind, I wish I could kill the men who did that to my friend Carrie. And it began to dominate her life, her hatred for these men. She had a boss where she worked, and the boss recognized this isn't going well, and she called Grace to her office and said, listen, you got to do something about this anger and this hatred that's in your heart because, Grace, it's going to destroy you. It's going to lead you back to your alcohol and back to your drugs and back to your addictions. And Grace said, I understand that, but I don't know how to get rid of it. And her friend wrote down these words on a piece of paper. She said this, if you can't forgive the sin, you must forgive the sinner. And Grace said, I didn't understand what that meant. But she said, I went home that night. And she said, I went out on my back patio and I prayed. And this was her prayer. All right, God, I don't know how to do this, but I surrender all my hate and resentment to you. God, that you know I'm full of rage and fear, and you know I don't even mean what I'm saying right now, but I can't go on hating like this. So God, I'm going to forgive those men for what they did to my friend. I forgive them in the name of Jesus, and I wish them love, joy, salvation, and redemption. All the things I have received from you I wish for them, and I'm sorry that I've resented them for so long. She said at that moment, the pain and hatred disappeared, and it never returned. You know what she did? She chose God's grace over her control. And what she did, you can do, and you can start today. We've been talking about giants today, and the only way to be victorious over the giants that we face is to have the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. He is the one who gives us the power. Now listen, if you're watching and you're not sure about your relationship with Jesus, maybe you just know about him, but you don't really know him in your heart, today is the day for you. Just pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost. I can't save myself, but I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead on the third day. I believe, Lord, that you'll save me if I'll cry out to you, and I do that right now. I turn from my sin, and I turn to you. Forgive me. Be my Lord and Savior, and I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer 
and mean it. The Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I would love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as your Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God and you're important to us and we're here for you. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you've messed up in life, God still loves you, and He has a wonderful plan for your life. You can find out more about that plan when you go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real